Hi everyone, I'm Tom and today I'm going to be playing Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion, which is a new standalone game in the Gloomhaven series that can be used as an introductory way of starting the game. The first few scenarios will strip things right down to basics and introduce the elements gradually to you if you're new. But at the same time, if you are an experienced Gloomhavener, then there are new scenarios, new enemy types, four new characters to play as, which can also be taken into main Gloomhaven. Just before we get started, I'd recommend you turn on Klingon subtitles. If anything needs correcting, that's where it'll be. And once the actual playthrough part starts, there is a handheld camera and a static camera version of the video, and you can switch between them in the description, depending on what you prefer. So here I'm going to be covering the very start of the new Jaws of the Lion campaign, which, as I mentioned, is a tutorial for the game essentially. If you are an experienced Gloomhaven player I'm also going to be doing a playthrough of Scenario 4 which does have most of the elements you'll be familiar with there that's linked in the description. But here we're going to be talking from the very beginning so when you get Jaws of the Lion you get this introductory page you read this before anything else it tells you how to unpack everything you know we've got a plastic tray for a lot of the components how to punch it all out how to punch the enemies out and they all go into little baggies with their action cards and standees and things. So we would unpack the game from this, and then we have the Learn to Play Guide. There is also a glossary, which is the rules in you know a form to reference when you need them, but not to learn through. And this is what's going to take us through the first five scenarios of the game. All it tells us on this first page, though, is to grab the scenario book and read the front of it. So let's do that now. If you don't want to see the story parts and stuff, you might be able to see in the, you know, the, the timeline of the video that you can skip ahead to the actual start of the, the gameplay of the scenario. But let's set the scene first. It will be good to get back to the sleeping lion. After a fortnight going up and down the still river, chasing a bad lead on a missing blacksmith, you can almost feel the warmth of the inn's hearth when Gloomhaven's walls come into view. You're almost home. To be fair, it's not just the blacksmith. An alarming number of people within the poorer districts of the city have gone missing. Usually nothing comes of it though. Just another poor soul forgotten out here on the edge of civilization. The blacksmith's wife, Sandy, however, managed to somehow scrape enough money together to hire you to find her husband. You're not sure where the money came from, but no matter the source, it couldn't have come easy, which makes it doubly painful to return to the city empty-handed. True, Sandy was a little light on the payment, but you are the jaws of the lion, one of the most well-known mercenary groups in this backwater dump of a town. Surely it can't hurt to take a charity case once in a while. Getting good jobs is about maintaining a reputation after all, which is why you really need to get to the bottom of this and not return to the widow with nothing but the calluses on your feet. Also, you probably shouldn't call her a widow to her face, at least not until the fate of the blacksmith has been confirmed. Given, however, that none of those who disappeared have returned, the outlook is grim. As these cheery thoughts pass through your mind, you notice movement up ahead and immediately draw your weapon. The sun has dipped low in the sky, reducing visibility, but you can clearly see some ramshackle wooden barricades blocking the road in front of you. And sure enough, as you cautiously approach the scene, vermlings jump out from behind the obstructions, flashing crude swords and sharp sticks. You have to admit, you're quite tired from the day's journey, but still, these oversized rats certainly picked the wrong group of travellers to ambush today. You are the jaws of the lion after all, and are always ready to show that there is only one outcome for anyone who dares threaten you. And so now it's giving us a reward already. It's nice of it, isn't it? And if you haven't yet, read the first section of the Learn to Play guide before starting Scenario 1. So what this reward is telling us is to unlock a new location on the map. And here is that map. This is a prequel to the main ginormous Gloomhaven game. And whereas that game took place on a suitably ginormous map, of which Gloomhaven was just a tiny part, this takes place you know, in and around just Gloomhaven. And so we were told by the scenario book, rewards, new location, roadside ambush, number one. And that goes in B1. So we have a sheet of location stickers here. I'll not spoil <laughs> the whole sheet, but you will grab... You know, stick a one from this sheet at this point. And we know that it goes in square B1. And you know, you've got little uh, guides of where to put it in there. I'm going to try and do a decent job of putting it in. There we go. So this is a, a permanent part of the game. You're putting stickers on it. And, you know, when you've done this scenario, you're going to put a big tick on that sticker. Permanently show that that is done. You can just keep track some other way if you would prefer not to make it permanent in that way. But there we go. We know where we are on the map and which scenario we are headed to. 
So flipping back to the how to play guide, it's now going to tell us about, it told us about putting the sticker on the map. It's now going to tell us about the characters. There are four new classes of character in Jaws of the Lion. There is the Red Guard, who is all about the how to play guide tells us protection and monster manipulation you know, he's got this great big hook on a chain and he's you know pulling and pushing monsters about with it here is the red god in miniature form we have the void warden who is all about healing and support and here is the void warden's mini but in these videos we're going to be looking at the other two classes it tells us down here that if you're playing by yourself you need to play as two classes and that's a bit more complicated you know, if you're playing in a normal multiplayer game you just want one class each to worry about i'm not on my own though i've got little glass marty who is going to be taking charge of the demolitionist and it tells us here that the demolitionist is all about melee damage and obstacle destruction here is the symbol of the demolitionist and the demolitionist in a miniature form now just like in gloomhaven on the other side of our player boards are backstories for our characters the first paragraph will tell you about their race so the demolitionist is a quattrel so it tells about quattrels and then specifically about demolitionists further down because of their diminutive size quattrels feel that they have a lot to prove from an early age they are encouraged to study as much as possible about many different subjects though there are expert quattrels in any field they seem to have a particular affinity to engineering and machinery. Their long, delicate fingers allow them to build all manner of intricate contraptions to make life easier and augment their inferior physical strength. Though they are not numerous, quattrels can easily integrate themselves into any society due to their expertise in critical fields and their charming, graceful demeanour. Only a fool would shun a quattrel's offer to help. And then specifically about the demolitionist. Even when augmenting themselves with machines of their own creation to destroy anything that stands in their path, Quattrels will still do it with charm and flair. Though they may be small, demolitionists don't let that hold them back in the least. Between their rocket boots, multitude of bombs, and giant piston fists, they are a force to be reckoned with. Sometimes the only path forward is the one they create themselves. In such cases, it is best just to get out of their way. So Marty will be right at home with some chaos and destruction. I, on the other hand, I'm going to be the hatchet, the Inox hatchet. We've seen the other, so let's see the hatchet's groovy symbol as well. Here he is in miniature form, kind of a cross between Predator and Robin Hood. And let's read a bit about the Inox and the Inox hatchet. The Inox are a primitive and barbaric race, preferring to live in small nomadic tribes scattered across the wilderness. There they subsist through hunting and gathering, scraping together a meagre existence while fighting off the more dangerous creatures of the wilds. What they lack in intelligence and sophistication, they make up for with their superior strength and size, always eager to prove themselves in a challenge, and one should certainly take care in challenging an Inox. Their society does not pay much heed to ethics or morality. For the Inox, it's all about survival, kill or be killed. While any normal Inox may be valued in Gloomhaven for their brute strength and endurance with manual labour, if you want to be a successful mercenary in the city, sometimes a little more finesse is required. Hatchets have fully embraced life in the city, outfitting themselves with the latest fashions. It's all a bit of a front though, as their true passion lies in their arsenal. No one is a better marksman with a throwing axe, and if anybody wants to challenge their claim, they had better be prepared for a duel to the death. So I think this is going to make for a very strong combo. So the how to play guide tells us that for our character, we are going to need the character mat, the figure of course, there's a deck of small cards with your character's symbol in the corner there. This is your attack modifier deck. Your initiative order token. This is something new to Jaws of the Lion. You want a hit point and experience dial. The left hand side is your hit points. And you can see on your character sheet here, it tells you based on your level what your maximum and starting hit points are. So for level one, I have eight. Then in the box, we have a pad of character sheets. You don't need these yet. And three packs of cards. Now, the ones that say halt on them are you know, cards that we'll be using later on when your character gets upgraded and levels up and stuff. You want the main pack of cards here. And from this, you take the first seven cards. One of them is a player reference and the other six have the letter A at the top here. And so that's everything that I'll need for the hatchet for this first scenario. So the next couple of pages of the learn to play guide are going to tell us all about setting up this first scenario. It tells us all about arranging our player area and the decks that we'll need and where we need them, the token tray and stuff. But a lot of this is going to take place on the scenario book. So it's time to open that up. 
Now, if you are familiar with Gloomhaven, you'll know that we have a scenario book that tells us the story and the setup and everything, but the actual game takes place on a load of tiles. We will grab certain tiles and put them together in different configurations to come up with you know, the, the terrain, the landscape for the scenario that we're playing. Well, in Jaws of the Lion, it works differently. We have a scenario book with the scenarios, you know, printed in there. Now, this uh, is all well and good for fitting the scenario book in, but we're going to need some space around it, don't we? And so here we go with a lot of things set up. You would, of course, want a little bit more space for your character area, but we're trying to fit everything in on the camera here. So each scenario is going to tell you a layout, and this refers to this scenario takes place on page two and three of the scenario book. And the enemy type that we'll need. So we just need the Vermling Raider for this. You have a big card for each of the enemy types. And this has all sorts of different levels on it that's going to make the enemy harder as your characters level up or if you want more of a challenge. So you pick the level that you're playing at, which is one for us to start with, and slide this into the envelope here. So all you can see is number one. And this is going to be space to track the damage that the different enemies will take as we fight them. These blue spaces on here show us where we can start. So I think that since uh, Marty is melee and I am ranged, we're going to go a little bit like this. I'm going to cower behind the demolitionist. And you know, this is outlined and reminded. It's in the learn to play guide to teach you about all of this stuff. But also it's on the scenario book in these things. So this is where your characters go. Remember the icons for setting up the monsters. All hexes with a green border are obstacles and cannot be entered, but the demolitionist can destroy them. So the enemy icons. If I just zoom in a bit here, you can see three coloured lines under each of the enemy icons. Now they refer to the number of players. So if you're playing with two players, three players, or four players, going top to bottom. Now, if there is a white line in the section that you are bothered about for your play account, then you need to grab a standee of the correct type at random, so just a random number, and you put it in a white stand and place it over there. If it is yellow, then that means it's an elite enemy, and so you grab a standee at random and put it in a yellow stand and place it on there. There are also spaces like this one here where the first bar is black and that means for a two-player game there is no enemy there. And so there we go with all of the enemies on here. Now there is an introduction to this scenario as well as some special rules, so let's have a look at those. So this is scenario one, roadside ambush, and our goal is to kill all enemies. So let's have a look at the introduction. The road back to Gloomhaven has been long. And now, to get attacked by vermlings when all you want is a warm meal and a soft bed, well, it makes you mad. Mad enough to kill these mangy creatures before you collapse from exhaustion. Of course, the vermlings have other plans. They gibber about wanting your coin and the meat on your bones. Nasty things, really. Best to ignore their ranting and end this quickly. And the special rules are telling us, make sure that you've just got your six A cards in your hand. And it tells us how the vermling raiders will act. Normally, we have cards that we draw from a little deck and they are going to determine round by round what each enemy type is going to do. For this first scenario, the enemies are always going to do the same thing. They're going to move and if they're next to one of us, they're going to attack. And so I think now it's time to get in there and let's start this roadside ambush. Hi everyone that's suddenly now in handheld camera. Remember you can switch in the description if you didn't mean to be here or missed the the stillness of the static camera. So here we go. We have, what is it, four, just four vermlings to, that are in our way, and we are gonna have to deal with them. So what happens in a round of Gloomhaven? And so, you know, the actual structure of the round and stuff is exactly the same as the main game. We have an overview here that tells us, and I'll just show you static cameras a little closer as well. The round overview is that we are going to choose cards, we order our initiative, we have our turns, and then we do some things at the end of the round. So card selection, each player on their own is going to pick two of their cards to play. You see that all of our cards are divided in two here. We're going to pick two cards and we're going to play the top part of one card and the bottom part of another. There is a number in the middle of every card. This is the initiative number. Of the two cards that you pick, 
you pick one of them to be your initiative, and that is basically going to determine the order in which we go in the round, lowest initiative to highest. We know thanks to the special rules for this scenario, the Vermlings are always going to be at 50. So you can make your choice depending on whether you want to be before or after the Vermlings this time. Remember, later on, they're going to draw from a deck in other scenarios, and you aren't going to know when they are going to go until we see that card. Now, you can discuss strategy with other players and you know the ideas of what you want to do this turn, but you can't discuss specifics. So you can't say which cards you're going to play or specific values of your attack or movement or your initiative or anything like that. So let's take a look at these A cards. Let's get rid of everything else for now. So these are the Demolitionist's A cards. Now you see that our characters usually have a hand limit of 9 and 10. And if we were starting in Gloomhaven or Frosthaven, we would have that many cards to start with. Jaws of the Lion, for these first few scenarios anyway, has stripped all of that away. We just have 6 cards to worry about, and that's the same for all of the classes. And the actions on them have been not only simplified, cards that would maybe do a load of things at once have been simplified to just do one thing or a couple of things, and they all have these blue boxes on here which are not normally on your cards. This is something brand new to Jaws of the Lion to help you learn the game. They describe what this means. So this card here that, you know, if, if you've read through the rulebook and your experience with Gloomhaven, obviously you're going to know what all of that does. But it's got all of these, uh, these new words if you're brand new to it. So it says attack two, range two, target two. So what does that mean? Well, up to two enemies within two hexes. So target two means it's going to attack up to two people. Range two means they have to be within two hexes of you. Suffer two damage. And that's what the attack two means. It's an attack with damage value two. Plus a separate modifier for each. Now, whenever we attack in Gloomhaven, the character that's attacking has their own modifier deck. All enemies share a modifier deck, but all the characters have their own individual. And so you would draw a card for each of those attacks, and that would affect the value. And it even reminds us that if we are doing a ranged attack and we are adjacent to an enemy, you have disadvantage. Now, disadvantage just means that when you would normally draw a card, you draw two and pick the worst one. Some things will give us advantage, and that means we draw two and pick the best one. And then move three just means move up to three hexes away. So we have... So let's have a look. We have we start off a little bit ranged, so we don't necessarily have to run straight up to this vermling here. We could uh, just fight, but then if we if we do fight this one, these vermlings are quite a way away. Now we know they're going to move their base movement value and attack if they're adjacent to someone. So what is that? Well, it says on their vermling raider card here, the left hand side is for normal enemies, the right hand side is for elite enemies. Now both types just move one space a turn, and their attack is two, and then modified by a card. So we could think about maybe moving out a little bit and trying to attack other enemies. And we could be talking about that and uh, trying to decide what we're going to do. So let's have a look here. So we could just do, we don't want to attack two different people, attack two at range four. You know, now the, the demolitionist could you know, start to run out here. What's, how, how much can the demolitionist move? Move two, destroy an obstacle. Move two, and then strengthen, and destroy an adjacent obstacle, and if you do strengthen. I think, now these are quite long range, aren't they? We don't particularly need that yet. I think we could go up, and yeah, we could, we could do an attack, couldn't we? Now this has got attack three, and this has got move two. I think that would be quite good. This is going to be a good combination. We're going to see it in action and see what it actually does. But we're going to try and move two, strengthen, and then attack three. He has to decide how quickly that he'd like to go. He's going to pick 20. So that one's going to go on the bottom. So when we flip them over, that's going to be his initiative number when it comes up. So you can put away his hand for now. And let's have a look at my cards, the Hatchets cards, which, you know, in their... A form are quite similar. They're not identical at all. Like I have got this heal self here. I've got a card that just adds to my attacks each turn. So Marty will have said he's going to try and hit this enemy. And we don't know if he's going to kill him straight away or just do a bit of damage. 
but I'm thinking maybe I want to try and move out a bit and can I attack some other enemies? So I have got range three on a lot of my attacks. You know, I am throwing axes, so a lot of my stuff is ranged. So I, I have a maximum of range three. So if I want to attack these enemies, one, two, three, I need to be standing around this space. Well, these two spaces actually, which is one, two, three, four, five away. Now I do have a move five. And I've got a card that is attack two, range three, target two. So I could maybe, what if I was standing one, two, three, four, five, two, three, one, two, three, I would be three away from both of these enemies and I could attack them both. And we know they only move one, so they wouldn't be able to get to me straight away either. Now I could just attack one of them for more damage, for three. But I do like the idea of attacking both. Now, Always in Gloomhaven, by picking one thing, you are giving up something else that is maybe not perfect in the situation that you're in, but in this case, it's a great card. The bottom of uh, double throw here is add plus one attack to all your attacks this turn. It's a really, really great card, and especially when you combine it with something like the Disorienting Barrage, it's just, it, it attacks three people at range three and muddles them all. Now, when they're muddled, they're all put at disadvantage, so they'll find it harder to uh, do damage. But it's just an attack one because it attacks so many people. But a great combo, if you're in a good situation for it, is to play this attack one and then plus one to all the attacks. So this is a really powerful attack two card. Unfortunately, we're not in range yet, and so we're going to have to get over there. I like the idea of running over with second wind and then doing double throw. Yeah, I think that's what I'm going to do. So, would I like to do it quickly? I think I would like to do it before they move. I wouldn't mind them moving a bit closer to me. So, I'm going to play this, and I'm going to go at speed 18. That's what I'm going to put face down. So, I can put my hand away for now as well. So, we've selected our cards, and then we would reveal an enemy card in a future scenario. Not in this one, though. Then we can order our initiative because we have these initiative order tokens in Jaws of the Lion. Now, before you would just have to remember this, but now we can look at everyone's revealed cards. So Marty would say my initiative is 20. I would say mine is 18 and the enemies we know is just 50. And so, you know, you would normally have an area of the table for this, but uh, I'll just squeeze it all in here. So we have the hatchet, the demolitionist, and then the Vermling Raider. We know this is the order for this round. So first it's going to be me, the Hatchet. So I look at my cards and you, know, you pick these two cards with probably an idea in mind of what you wanted to do, but you, you don't necessarily know what the enemies or other players are going to do. They might get in your way. They might mess things up for you. And so it's only at this point when your turn actually starts that you have to decide what to do with your cards. Now, later on, these are going to mean something, but for scenario one, you don't have to worry about these little symbols. The cards just do what they say in their big text boxes. So I could change my mind and add one to all my attacks this turn and heal three, but obviously that would be a terrible idea. So I am going to move five, and then I'm going to try and double throw some axes. So move five is just move five hexes. You can move through allies. You can't move through enemies. I'm just going to go one, two, three, four, five, which, yes, I've counted right. That does put me in range of these enemies. Now, you don't have to use all the movement points that you're given. You can't move through obstacles either. You can't move outside the edge of the board and things like that. But I want to use my full movement because I would like to get a clear throwing axe shot at the elite Vermling Raider and his uh, little sidekick there. So I am done with my second wind there. That can go in my discard pile. You see on my player board here, it says discard and lost. Now we'll, uh, we'll deal with that a bit later and active in other scenarios. But for this one, we just have to worry about, for right now, we just have to use discard. So then I have double throw. So up to two enemies within three hexes suffer two damage plus a separate modifier for each. Now we're not adjacent, so we don't have to worry about disadvantage. And so I have two attacks here. These are both in range three. And you know you, you decide who you're attacking first and then draw a card for them. So let's say the elite first. So I have base damage two, and then I'm gonna draw a card from this deck to find out what my modifier is. Plus two, that's a great result. So that's four damage on the elite. We have damage tokens here. So I'm gonna grab a three and a one. 
because the Vermling Raider doesn't say that it has armor or anything like that. And so we know that from the standee, this is number six. And so in the sixth section of this envelope, I'm going to put that four damage. Elites have 10 hit points, so this one has six left now. Then my next attack is going to be on the normal Vermling Raider. I draw the modifier card, and that's a plus one. So that's a great result. It is, you know, more risky later on than I've had uh, the good cards in a row. So it's uh, more and more likely that that miss is coming up. But then again, it's more and more likely that the double is coming up. So there we go. We've done three damage to the standard one. They have five health, so he's just got two left. He is number three, so we can put that damage on him. And the card is all done now, so that can go in my discard pile as well. So for next turn, I have four cards to choose from. And we can move on to the next player, which is the Demolitionist for this round. So Demolitionist has got Knock Out the Support and Piston Punch. So she could just change her mind and stay where she is and stun an adjacent enemy and attack an adjacent enemy. <laughs> Wouldn't be a great idea right now. So it's going to move to... Then... Destroy an adjacent obstacle. If you do, strengthen yourself. So the demolitionist is going to destroy this obstacle just because it's going to allow it to strengthen. The, 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 the thrill, the rush of uh, destroying this rock is, uh, is really powering her. So we can grab a destruction token here and place it where the obstacle used to be. That is now a normal hex that anyone can walk through. So now it says strengthen self because we destroyed the obstacle. So we can grab a strengthen token and place it on the demolitionist. And because she didn't start the turn with this condition, if she'd started the turn with it, it would go away at the end of this turn. But she didn't start the turn with it. So she's going to have this until the end of her next turn. So on all her attacks, she's going to get advantage. And so we're done with this. She moved, destroyed the obstacle and strengthened herself. So we're just going to have to slot this under the, the health tracker there. And so now Piston Punch with uh, her great big uh, power fists, uh, she is going to punch the Vermling Raider in front of it with attack three is the base value. And because she is strengthened, she is at advantage. So draws two of these cards and picks the best one. So plus zero and minus one. We'll stick with plus zero then. And so that is going to be three damage to this Vermling Raider. So he has got two left as well, which number? Number two. And we have now finished our turns. It's worth noting, by the way, I didn't mention this for the hatchet's turn. There is line of sight in Gloomhaven, but it's very generous. As long as any part of your hex can see any part of the enemy's hex, you've got line of sight to them. Obstacles, other people don't block line of sight. Walls do, though. These uh, double lines on the edge of the map, they are you know, the walls of this particular scenario. And there will be walls in there when we have rooms and things. So now we come to the monsters' turns. And we know exactly what they're going to do because of scenario one. And so we start off with elites. They always go first and they go in numerical order. So when an enemy activates, it works out who its focus is going to be. Now, its focus is the enemy it can get to the quickest. So not necessarily the closest, you know, if we were right next to him, but there was a wall here blocking it off and the door was somewhere up here, they would, you know, go for somebody else, perhaps. This is quite a simple way of working it out, though, because you know, the, the, there are two enemies right here and I am obviously much closer with nothing in between us. So I am going to be the elite enemy's focus. And we know that it's going to move its base attack value and then attack its basic attack value if it's adjacent to anything. So it's just going to move one, not adjacent to anything, and so can't attack. And that is the end of this Vermling Raider's turn. And then we do the standard one. So number one up here is going to move down. There are obstacles blocking off all of this direction, so he's got to come down here first to get to me. Number two is over here and is in front of the Demolitionist. And yes, the, the raider here is going to get to attack. So his base attack value is two and we draw a modify card. That's plus zero. So the demolitionist is going to take two damage and tick down to six health there. And finally, number three is going to focus me as well. The quickest path is, you know, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. It's going to come this way 
and follow in the elite's footsteps. That is the elite's turn. So we can uh, ignore this initiative now because it's going to be a new round. We need to pick two more cards. So let's go. We have for the demolitionist. The demolitionist probably just wants to you know, do the, the two more damage required on this raider. So a ranged attack isn't necessary. So he has attack three muddle. Perhaps should have done that last round because uh, it would have given disadvantage on the Vermling's attack. And one two punch. One adjacent enemy suffers two damage. Then the same or a different enemy suffers another damage plus modify. So yeah, it's going to be perhaps overkill, perhaps a more powerful attack than required because you have to do you know all of the top and then all of the bottom or the other way around. You can't just do the attack two, then move, then do the attack one. It would be uh, nice in this situation if we could, but you can't do that. So uh, actually, the Marty could you know, move away and then do a ranged attack as he's running backwards. If you could get into, say, well, actually, if you could get where I'm standing, I'm standing two away from everyone because he's got this uh, range two target to. If he was standing here, he could attack this one and this one. What if I got out of the way? Then Marty is, you know, in a in a place where he can get hit. Or if you could come over here, one, two, three. You could do move three and then do a ranged attack. His move three has got his ranged attack on it, though. Or he could just use a melee attack. Let's, let's just do an attack three. Yeah, he'll just do this attack three, implode, which will muddle. And he wants to do some movement as well. Now, this one's just, this one is all just attack on the top and bottom. If he wants to move, he's going to have to use some of his cards, isn't he? He's going to do this. He's going to have implode and then a ranged attack. I'm not sure which way around he's going to do it, but he's going to do it at 19 so he can get there before the Vermling has a chance to attack him. And so his other two cards go back into his hand. And as for me, what cards have I got left? So I... I've got this that can attack three people at range three. I don't have my card that can add one to all the attacks, unfortunately, but it would muddle them all, which would help with attacking as well. We know that they can only move one as well. So if I moved even one space, then I know that enemies aren't going to be able to get to me. Now, if I muddle them, there's no point muddling them if I know that they can't attack. Whereas I could move two, I could move in and then do a damage to all adjacent enemies. Unfortunately, though, I would be right next to them and they would uh, be ready to hit me. I think let's focus on trying to take this elite out. So I, it's a bit overkill here. I'm using a move four. But that is, uh, I, I don't want to use up any ranged attack cards because I, I want to be ranged attacking all day long. So I'm going to do close cuts and stopping power with uh, 25. So we reveal now we've picked. So it's going to be demolitionist first this time, then me, the hatchet. And finally, the Vermling Raiders, who are still at 50. So, what is the Demolitionist going to do? He's going to, yeah, he's just, just going to hit this Raider and then move to get in a good position here, I think. I think that was the plan. So, it's going to be an attack three first, causing muddle. Still strengthened with advantage. So, it's going to be attack minus one, minus one. So, it's going to be attack two, but luckily, two is all he needed. So the Vermling Raider is killed. We can take the rest of the HP off the tracker there. And when enemies are killed, now for you know experienced Gloomhaveners, a money token is usually put in the space where an enemy has died. But we don't worry about that for Scenario 1 or any kind of looting or anything like that. So he's done the attack 3 and muddle. And then can move up to 4. So what's... Which attack has he got left? It's an up-close and personal attack left. It's either the one-two punch or wants to be in range two. And we know these enemies are going to be here. So again, probably wants to be stood where I am. <laughs> but um, yeah, could go, could go over here because could move again next time. If he could get adjacent to both of them, could do his one-two punch and maybe take both of them out. Ooh, that's a thought. So yes, Explosive Blitz is just going to move over there for now. And so we've had the Demolitionist. It's time for the Hatchet. And so we have Center Mass and Disorienting Barrage. I was just going to attack the Elite, I think, and move away. Attacking these two would be nice, 
but it would just be for one, and we don't need to muddle them because what's the point in them being under disadvantage if they aren't going to attack? Uh, we also, that reminds me, that the Demolitionist has had this for a full turn now, had it at the start of her last turn, and loses it now. And so I am just going to move away. I think I'm just going to move away one space. I don't particularly need to be that far away. That's not far enough, is it? <laughs> because uh, the Elite can just move straight to me in a different way. Okay, so I have moved, and then I'm going to do attack three at range three on the Elite. I am three away, one, two, three hexes. And so I draw a card, minus one. So that is just going to be attack two in the end then. So we can take uh, this one off. It's got six damage. It's got four health left. And yes, that's it for us, isn't it? So we can go to the Vermling Raiders turn, starting with the Elite. They pick a focus. Let's see, Marty is three away. I am three away. If there is a tie, you go in initiative order. So the focus will be the Demolitionist. Then for the others, this one will move one space, this one will move one space, and we are done for another round. We've only got two cards to pick from, so your only real choice on this turn is what your initiative number wants to be. Now, I think Marty wants to go first. If he wants to get in there with his one-two punch, he's going to try and go quickly. 37 is how quickly he can go, which is definitely quicker than the Vermling Raiders. Does he want to be quicker than me, though? So my last cards are Close Cuts and Stopping Power. So the Up Close Attack 3 and a Range 3 Attack 3. I am either 25 or 35. Now I would probably... If Marty's told me he wants to get in there and attack, I probably want to try and go a little bit slow. So I'm going to go at 35. But uh, unfortunately when we reveal... Uh, yeah, Marty's quickest was 37. So I am going first either way. So it's going to be me, Marty, Vermlings. So Hatchet first. What do I want to do? Do I just want to attack? I don't, I don't see much point of running in there. We, we need to go after this enemy next. So I think I'll just keep going at the Elite. So the Elite's got four health left. The other one's only got two health left. So yeah, I'm, I'm just going to attack three and then I'll start moving over to, to this enemy perhaps. So yes, let's do stopping power first. That's a, an attack three at range three. Draw the card, minus one. So it's two damage on the elite there. So what's that? That's eight damage. So just two health left for him. And then I'm going to move up to four. See, this enemy can only make it up to here. So what if I just move a couple of spaces? I could even, you know, tuck myself away here and get ready to just attack him with a load of ranged attacks, knowing that... He's melee, so he's going to have to walk all the way around here one space at a time at me. So yeah, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run off up there. I hope you're okay, Marty. <laughs> I, I can always run back to you, if, uh, as long as I keep that move five card. We might lose cards in a minute, we will see. Okay then, so the, the Demolitionist is doing the one-two punch, isn't he? Okay, so let's start. Let's see, the Elite doesn't hit hard, it just has more health in this scenario. Because the cards are always going to be the same. And so, yeah, let's let's try and take out the Elite. So Marty's going to use the big one. Actually, he might as well stay ranged, hadn't he? Because the 1-2 the punch is attack 2, then attack 1. Whereas the big one is attack 2, target 2, range 2. So he can stay away from them. So he could even move. Actually, the 1-2 punch doesn't allow him to move. So he would have to just stand there on the spot, unfortunately. But, you know, that's the same as running in there. Actually, this, this one is three away, so... If he wants to hit them both, he's going to have to move in there. So the big one is going to let him move right in, and hopefully he takes one of them out. So he's going to do his, uh, his one-two punch. He's going to do attack two on the elite. He really wants the elite taken out. Double damage. So that is going to be four damage to that elite. That's going to be plenty to take it out of the scenario. And we have a, a symbol that we're seeing for the first time here in the corner of the two times card. This means that at the end of this round, we're going to shuffle Marty's attack modifier deck. There is the same symbol on the miss card as well. So we still have an attack one to do on the standard raider. And that's going to be plus one. Perfect. He's got two health left. The Demolitionist is doing some 
serious damage, which is great. So that is the end of the Demolitionist's turn. The Vermling is just going to kind of helplessly come around here. He's seen everybody else get uh, kind of very easily taken out. So now in the end of round phase, we can look at a new thing. We've got no cards left. So what happens? Well, there is a short rest in Gloomhaven. And again, for you know experienced players, there's more than that. But for, for scenario one, there is a short rest. And this just means that you shuffle your discard at the end of the round. You are going to pick a card at random from it. So I've just quickly shuffled our discard piles there. So we take a card at random. And this is my, oh, it's a nice, uh, powerful ranged attack. This card is now lost. So for the rest of this scenario, I do not have access to this card. So this is how we lose cards in the first scenario. And if we should ever get to a point where we've lost too many cards and we don't have any cards to play anymore, uh, we, we are out. We're exhausted, the same as we would be if we lost all of our health. We're out of the scenario. So I have these cards back in my hand now. The, the five that didn't get discarded are able to be used again next turn. Marty is going to lose uh, the attack three, the piston punch, attack three, or stun a target enemy. So they are permanently, well, for this scenario, permanently out. And we just start a new round. So let's see, the Demolitionist has everything available to her again. So let's see, a range, in terms of ranged attacks, it's got attack two. Or could just get right in there and uh, do an attack three and try and do as much damage as possible. What about this attack three and muddle? Or maybe having two attacks would be the best. Let's see. Needs to either. Can now the move two destroy an obstacle and strengthen would be great, but two isn't quite enough to move her close enough to the raider. But what if... What if Marty could go after the Raider? Yeah, it's going to do one two punch with its speed of 66. And, you know, I might get lucky and just uh, take out the Raider in my attack. But if not, Marty is going to get a very good chance to. So Marty's going to go at 66. And can be saying to me, I'm going to go slower this round. Uh, I, I need the, I, I want the Raider to move to me. And so for me, I just want ranged attacks, don't I? I. Well, what about double throw, add one attack to all your attacks this turn, and center mass and attack three with range three. See, am I within three? One, two, three. Yep, that is perfectly fine. I don't mind about going uh, quick, quickly or slowly, so I will just go at uh, 24. So we reveal Marty is 66. I am 24. So 24, 50 for the Raider, 66 for Marty. So I am going to be first here. I'm staying where I am, but I am adding plus one attack to all my attacks, which means this center mass attack is an attack four. And we draw a card, minus one, unfortunately. So it's going to be attack three. So the Vermling Raider lives another turn. And so it's number one. So three damage over there. I am done. It's the Raider's turn to move a space and kind of helplessly do nothing. And then it's, it's Marty's big one-two punch. The Marty is going to move to destroy an adjacent obstacle. I'll destroy this one because, you know, if you destroyed this one, it would be easier for the Raider to come and get me. So destroyed uh, obstacle. That's the wrong side to put that. And if you do, strengthen self. So this means that, you know, it's, it's perhaps overkill in this situation. But with strengthen, each of Marty's attacks are going to get two cards drawn. So now he's going to do the attack two on the top of the one two punch. Two cards and pick the best. Zero is the best out of those. So that's two damage, which, yes, does take out the Raider. Uh, his next attack would have been, oh, we would have got plus one instead of minus one, thanks to the advantage. But the Raider has already taken five damage, has already suffered enough, and can be taken out of the scenario. If you remember from the start, our goal was to kill all enemies, which we have achieved. And so now we can read the conclusion. You wipe the blood of the last vermling from your face, and your thoughts return to the sleeping lion. Surely they've got a stew ready by now. It would be so perfectly warm and soothing, and it's right through that gate. So close you can already taste it. But then another thought comes. It's highly unusual. Brazen, really, for a pack of vermlings to operate this close to the city. Could they be behind the string of disappearances? It's a long shot, but one worth investigating, especially considering the ambush site doesn't look like their base of operations. There's probably a nest nearby that, with any luck, We'll have more information on the missing blacksmith and treasure. Treasure would be nice.
It also tells us that we have a reward of a new location, a hole in the wall. Now, just before we switch back to the map and everything, it's worth noting that our characters all reset back to full for the next scenario. So full health, any positive or negative statuses get taken off them. You get all of your lost cards back. Your modifier decks are going to be shuffled up. You basically get returned back to this starting state for the next scenario. And so here we are back at the map of Gloomhaven. I've got sticker two off the sheet here. And it's also going in B1. You can see it lining up with the wall here. It's a hole in the wall of Gloomhaven. We can also check off scenario one to show that it has been completed because you don't replay scenarios that you have successfully finished. Another new thing it tells us to do at the end of scenario one is to grab a character sheet for each of our characters. You need to name them so we can finally reveal that uh, my hatchet is Ron Caramel and the demolitionist was called Boom Shake the Room and you cross out box one to show that you are level one. All the rest of it will be covered in other scenarios. You don't have to worry about any of that now. It also tells us about some card upgrades. You need to grab from your character box your two B cards here, and you might notice that they have got the same name as two of your A cards. So you need to find those A cards and remove them. Now they have been upgraded into these B cards, and that's exactly what's happened because you see my close cuts card here. It was just attack three on the top. Well, now it's attack three with this picture on. This picture means the gray is you, the hatchet, where you're standing, and the red is enemies. So you could attack two adjacent enemies standing in this formation with the close cuts now. And instead of just move four, it's move four and loot one. Now, loot refers to, you know, any money that's on the ground and any treasure that's around. You would gather that up in a one hex radius around you. Center mass is the same on the top, but instead of just move three, it now has push. Now you can push enemies away from you. The demolitionists, the big one, well, it didn't seem that big, did it? Attack two people at range two. Well, what it should actually be is attack three, range two, with this great big pattern here. You know, it's a great big bomb that she's throwing around. But this introduces a new thing to Gloomhaven as well. This symbol here, the lost symbol. So we talked about you lose cards for short rests. You lose this card if you decide to play it for its top ability. The bottom's fine. That hasn't got that symbol on it. But if you decide to do this big bomb, this is a lost card. And that is a big decision in Gloomhaven. When do you play these? When is it worth it? Because it's kind of accelerating when you're going to run out of cards and get exhausted. But their effects can be massive. You know, if you, if you could get this, what's this, uh, seven enemies in one big go, drawing a modifier for each with attack three, that could be huge. And on the bottom, it uh, pushes one as well as moves three like it used to. And finally, one, two punch. We saw it uh, plenty in that scenario, just used to do attack two, attack one. It still does that, but if you attack the same enemy twice with both of these attacks, you can push it away and muddle it, so give it disadvantage. And on the bottom, as well as having attack one, it's now got loot one. So you see for the just the A cards, it simplified it right down. We don't need loads of these concepts yet, we can just introduce these things bit by bit. So that was scenario one of Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. I hope that gives you a good idea of, you know, maybe the Gloomhaven system for the first time, how this new game is, you know, shrinking it down and making it as simple as possible for new players to experience. If you'd like to see more, I am also doing a playthrough of scenario four. Or you can, of course, look at my main Gloomhaven playthrough I did a while ago, or the prototype playthrough I did for the ginormous sequel Frosthaven that funded on Kickstarter a few months ago or you can skip right ahead to my thoughts on Jaws of the Lion. Wherever you end up though thank you very much for watching this video and I will see you for the next game. Bye! <laughs>